Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da Habita fillah Continuing on in our study of Bulug al-Maram The Book of Marriage The chapter, the tenth chapter uh, Al-Li'an uh, And this is invoking curses uh, Against oneself regarding the allegation of adultery. So uh, Le'an, it stands for the allegation of adultery sworn against one's wife. And in this chapter, the ahadith that we'll be covering are all hadith according to, uh, regarding this hukum and the rulings pertinent to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al Indeed, those who falsely accuse chast, unaware, and believing women are cursed in this world and the hereafter, and they will have a great punishment. On a day when their tongues, their hands, and their feet will bear witness against them as to what they used to do, that day Allah will pay them in full their true recompense, and they will know that it is Allah who is the manifest truth. In this verse, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, illustrates for us or lets us know that it is a serious and grievous sin uh, to accuse the righteous women, that this is one of the major sins, and that the one who does so will incur a serious, a, a serious punishment in the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits the believers to falsely accuse uh, innocent people of adultery and he threatens those committing such a sin with severe torment. And this hukum is not just pertaining to women, this is in general and nor is it just pertinent to uh, adultery. That claiming and falsely claiming and lying against others is a grievous sin and it is something unbefitting for the believer. Moreover, Allah has ordained <clears throat> that whoever accuses a Muslim of adultery or fornication without producing four witnesses must be punished with 80 lashes and considered uh, a, a disobedient person, meaning a fasik unless he repents after that and corrects himself. And in this regard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and those who accuse chaste women and then do not produce four witnesses, lash them 80 lashes and do not accept from them testimony ever after. And those who are defiantly disobedient, uh, except for those who repent after that and correct themselves, for indeed Allah is all forgiving most merciful. And this is in Surah Al-Nur, uh, Surah Al-Nur, uh, verse, verses 4 through 5. And so in this chapter, it affirms for us again that the seriousness of ac falsely accusing uh, someone of fornication and, without producing witnesses, and that this person uh, is deserving of a severe torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So both of those verses show the stern punishment and ruling applied when a Muslim accuses a woman other than his wife of adultery. So that's the general hukum uh, that when someone uh, accuses someone falsely of zina, that this is the punishment that they will incur. However, when a Muslim man accuses his own wife with adultery, so this is where the li'an comes uh, from, uh, accuses his own wife of, with adultery, there is another ruling to be applied, and this is a li'an. Uh, and li'an is four testimonies ensured by sworn oaths taken by each spouse and accompanied by the curse or wrath of Allah upon the liar. As will soon be explained, if a man charges his wife with adultery and cannot produce clear evidence, either uh, through witnesses, then Li'an 
can spare him the legal punishment for the false accusation of adultery. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al -kareem, And those who accuse their wives of adultery and have no witnesses except themselves, then the witness of one of them shall be for testimonies, swearing by Allah that indeed he is the truthful. And the fifth, meaning the fifth oath, uh, will be that the curse of Allah be upon him. And that's where the li'an, because la'ana means to curse someone. Uh, and that the curse of Allah would be upon him if he should be amongst the liars. So the person is testifying against themselves, uh, sw sw swearing this oath uh, before the judge, saying that I, she committed adultery, and they bear this testimony fourth time. The fifth time they incur a curse that if they are lying, that they uh, should incur the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, but if, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and the fifth will, will, will be that the curse of Allah be upon him if he should be amongst the liars. But it will prevent punishment from her if she gives four testimonies swearing by Allah that indeed he is of the liars. And the fifth oath will be that the wrath of Allah will be upon her if he was the truthful one. And this is in Surah Al Nur, uh, verses 6 through 9. So, here, this, those two, uh, those verses, they show us how the Li'an, uh, the, the ruling of Li'an, how it, uh, uh, what the ruling is and how it takes place. It gives us actually the details in those uh, verses. And we'll study, as we get into the ahadith in this chapter, we will get into more details and how it was implemented in the sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, <clears throat> to, for clarity, thus the husband says four times, I testify by Allah that my wife has committed adultery. He must point at his wife if she is present. Or mention her name if she is absent. In the fifth testimony, he says the same, but he adds, And may the curse of Allah be upon me if I am lying. In reply and defense, the wife says four times, I testify by Allah that he is lying about the adultery he has charged me with. And in the fifth time, in the fifth testimony of this, uh, she says the same, but she adds, and may the wrath of Allah be upon me if he is telling the truth. This is because the one who knows the truth and denies it incurs the wrath of Allah. So that is the li'an. There are some conditions for the validity of the li'an, and we'll also detail those more with the ahadith. But in general, uh, the first is that the two spouses are legally accountable. So they need to be uh, uh, legally uh, considered, uh, you know, uh, accountable uh, as in age and, and what have you. Uh, second, the husband charges his wife with adultery. So this is the second condition of Li'an, is that the husband is actually charging his wife with adultery. And the third a condition, the wife keeps on refuting him and charging him with lying until the end of the Li'an, until they actually make the curse. Uh, also, the uh, the fourth condition being the li'an is conducted by a judge. So there needs to be a judge. There needs to be someone in authority to educate in this situation, in these, these cases. Uh, in the case that the li'an meets all of the aforementioned uh, conditions and it is made uh, in, in the way that we have mentioned, it results in the following legal rulings. So these are the rulings pertinent to uh, if the li'an has taken place, if they have finished. Uh, so number one, the husband becomes no longer liable to be punished for false accusations of adultery. The second point, the couple must be separated. So when it comes when the, the bond has come to this level that they are before the judge and they're making this accusation of adultery, then they add, then after that, the couple must be separated and the wife becomes prohibited for the husband to remarry forever. So with this, this, this shows us the seriousness of the Li'an. And third, her children will no longer bear the name of the husband. 
uh, if the latter denies the child during Le'an by saying, this child is not mine. So this shows you the full implications of such a serious uh, accusation, the repercussions of that accusation, the process of going through the, that before a judge, and likewise, the uh, after this has uh, been educated and completed, that, and especially if there are children uh, between the spouses and the husband makes this accusation and says that that is not even my child, then after that situation and that it's been judged and has, has been through this full process and he is denied even the, the custody of his child or the child, then in that situation, then the child does not even take his name. So that shows just how serious and how humiliating that can be and how serious the crime of zina is and how serious this type of uh, divorce is. So this shows us that it is uh, a very serious, uh, uh, a serious um, matter, an affair, and that we are all held accountable for the actions of our tongue. In the first hadith, <clears throat> the 936th hadith, in my um, copy, narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, so and so asked and said, O Allah's Messenger, what do you think if one of us finds his wife committing adultery? How should he act? If he talks, he would talk about a grievous affair. And if he keeps silent, he would keep silent about something similar, meaning that it's very grievous and, and, uh, and serious. He gave no answer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Afterwards, he came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said, I have been afflicted with the very problem which I had asked you about. Then Allah revealed the verses of Surah, Surah An-Nur, he then recited them to him and exhorted, admonished, and informed him that the punishment of this world is easier than that of the hereafter. He said, Know by him who sent you with the truth. I have not lied against her. He then summoned the woman and exhorted her in the same way. She said, Know by him who sent you with the truth. He is a liar. He began with the man, and the man bore witness four times with an oath by Allah. He then did the same with the woman. Then he separated them, reported by Muslim. <clears throat> In this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, we learn about the ruling of Li'an and that Li'an, this invoking of curses uh, when there is an accusation of adultery on the part of uh, the wife, then this hukum, uh, this hukum, uh, this ruling is becomes pertinent and this hadith illustrates for us the ruling of Li'an and this happens in the case when a person uh, uh, accuses their spouse or uh, when the man accuses his wife of zina and he says, for example, you are a, an adulteress or some other um, way of articulating this same uh, speech. And it shows us how serious uh, the actions of the tongue are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this regard, وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْسَنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ Yet, yet to be arbati shuhada. Fajli duhum thamania thamanin jilda. Walla takbalu lohum shahada abada. 
wa ulaika humul fasiqun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we already mentioned this in Surah Al-Nur, in the fourth verse, and those who uh, accuse the righteous uh, women, and then they do not bring four witnesses. Their punishment is that they will be, uh, they will receive 80 lashes, and that their testimony will never be accepted from them. So now they are no longer trustworthy. Verily, those are the fasakun. Those are the wicked doers. Or, you know, they are the ones who have committed this wicked and grievous sin. And that also makes, uh, shows us the relevant of the statement in the hadith when Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, uh, and if he talks, he would talk about a grievous affair. And if he keeps silent, he would keep silent about something similar, meaning it is grievous. That is so, it's a very serious and wicked sin, and it's a wicked sin to make this accusation falsely. From this hadith, some of the uh, immense, uh, some of the benefits we gain from this hadith is it shows us that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een were very, uh, they had a lot of ghira, they had a lot of uh, jealousy. And this ghira, what is known as ghira, is different than the term we use, uh, for example, hasid. It's, it's, it's very different in meaning because ghira, although we may translate it similar and say jealousy, ghira is in a positive way. For example, to have ghira, to have jealousy over your wife. You know, this is your lawful, this is your wife and for her not to parade around without hijab or whatever the case and sit amongst men and things like this. This is a positive type of jealousy. It's not an envy. It's, it has nothing to do with wanting to remove the netma from someone. But rather, this is a type of protection and something that the women feel comforted from. Many women feel comforted that their husband takes this interest and that he has a type of jealousy and is concerned about them being uh, looked at or, or, uh, and, and about their, their welfare in general. So this is in a positive sense, this ghira. Likewise, there is ghira in regards to the uh, the boundaries of Allah, set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith, this hadith illustrates for us the Sahaba had ghira in both uh, respects. They had ghira, this type of jealousy regarding their wives, and they had this ghira, and this is an honorable type of ghira, or honorable type of jealousy, if you will, and they also had ghira or jealousy with regards to the boundaries us and the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that they became upset when they saw someone breaking Islamic law, when they saw someone being disobedient to Allah. They didn't rejoice as we do. We think it's humorous. Oh, so-and-so committed zina. So-and-so did this. So-and-so, you know, whatever sin, this happened. You know, even people brag about their sins. Whereas the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, anu majma'in, were very, they had ghira jealousy over the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this hadith is an illustrate uh, illustrates for us as was uh, as we found with the statement of uh, of Umar another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that it is permissible for the person for the uh, uh, the sheikh or the one who is uh, giving the fatwa, the judge or what have you, to prohibit or not to answer, to not to answer the, uh, the statement or the question of the one seeking fatwa or the one seeking judgment. If they see maslaha in that, if they see that there is benefit in not answering. And 
in this hadith, we see that initially the Prophet ﷺ didn't answer. He didn't answer until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse, uh, uh, a verse to him. So waiting for wahi, because it was so serious, it was such a grievous sin, and something so uh, detestable that he didn't even want to speak about it, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Nor did the one asking for the fatwa even want to speak about it, because it was so serious. It was such a serious crime to accuse a righteous woman of this, of doing, of committing zina, and likewise, uh, so the, this, you know, false accusation, and likewise, to even have this business out there of, uh, of you know, someone having done such a wicked sin. So this shows us that there are times when it is uh, necessary or when it is permissible for the judge or the sheikh, you know, the one, the, the mufti, uh, that when they are asked a question to not, it's not necessary that they always answer it. It's permissible for them not to answer if they see that there's fitna that's going to occur from that. Likewise, this can happen in a situation where sometimes people are asking about the ruling of a particular individual. You know, what's, what do you think about so-and-so? Uh, what's the ruling on so-and-so? Or, or about such and such issue, a very controversial issue, that they see that by them answering, this is going to cause a, a greater fitna, a greater harm in the community and a harm to the listener or harm to the society or the people. So in that situation, that there's maslaha in not answering. So we learn that from this hadith. This hadith illustrates for us. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, illustrates for us that the Quran is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the speech of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way, the, how we understand that from this hadith is that in the hadith, uh, after the, the question that the Prophet ﷺ didn't want to answer until was, uh, the verse was revealed, uh, in the hadith it contains in the Arabic it says, فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ الْآيَاتِ That Allah then revealed these verses. Letting us know that the Speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wahi, it is revelation. That is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the alu or the uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because uh, as was mentioned, we just mentioned for anzala. You know, so then descended the revelation. The revelation was was revealed, and it descended. And so this is uh, this shows us the alu of Allah subhanahu wa taala that Allah subhanahu wa taala is above His creation, and that revelation uh, descended uh, from from the heavens from Allah subhanahu wa taala that He revealed and His revelation. And through the angel Jibreel, it was delivered to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is in accordance uh, that, uh, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is uh, uh, above uh, His creation. This is in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the, uh, the Ijma of the Salaf, the Ijma of the Ulama and Ahl Sunnah. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the greatest type of preaching and speech that will give you uh, move, move your heart and have an effect on your heart comes from the Quran. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way we understand that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he waited for the wahi. He could have spoke and spoke from himself, but rather he speaks from wahi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used the wahi from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as evidence and to uh, deal with this, uh, this situation that uh, uh, came from this accusation this man made uh, with regards to his wife. And another benefit of this hadith is 
this hadith also shows us that it is not permissible for the judge to, in this situation, after, you know, this has occurred between uh, a husband and a wife, to necessarily to, uh, to mention them and to uh, and specify them by name and so forth and mention this grievous thing that happened between them uh, as this is a fitna and especially as these accusations this could have been a false accusation so this would tarnish the reputation obviously of the woman and likewise uh, and the man if uh, in, in the other situation so their affair does not need to be publicized amongst the people in the community. This hadith also illustrates for us, the it, it affirms for us, the punishment in the hereafter. That, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Adab al-dunya ahwanu min adab al, min, min adab al akhirah That the punishment in, the, in this life is uh, much less, much less severe than the punishment in the hereafter. So the 80 lashes that would occur for a person who was proven, who, who, who makes a false accusation of, of, uh, of zina or something against someone, or lies against someone, then this is light compared to the punishment in the hereafter for the same sin. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that if a person is tested in this life with some test, some difficulty, then this may be a part of punishment for him. And it also can be an expiation if they are patient and they make it through with iman and khair. Uh, and likewise, as we mentioned, that the punishment in this life is much less than the punishment in the hereafter. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, also shows us that the Prophet wasallam was a messenger of Allah wasallam uh, with truth. And this shows, uh, as was evidenced in the hadith, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that a person, uh, it, it, it is possible and it happens that people swear and they make oaths and they could in fact be lying. So it doesn't mean just because someone makes an oath and they swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are being truthful, that does not mean they are truthful. In fact, they could be a liar. And this hadith illustrates for us because here in a situation where you have a husband and a wife both swearing uh, and testifying before a judge saying that they, uh, you know, in accordance with this affair of Li'an, then uh, and, and the seriousness of it, they're both swearing that they uh, swearing and also having the punishment of Allah invoked against them. And still, if they both maintain this, one of them obviously is lying. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, this hadith also shows us that there should be four witnesses when making the accusation of adultery. So this shows us how seriousness, the seriousness of this affair, and that it's not an issue uh, of just making an accusation against someone and then that person being punished. So it, there must be four witnesses. So it shows how serious, how serious the issue is and that it is not an easy thing to get to this a punishment, to this HUD, as uh, we see, unfortunately, in many societies, in Muslim societies, in which they sometimes take these things lightly and they punish and execute women. And women are, unfortunately, the ones who are abused and suffer in, in many situations throughout the world. This hadith also illustrates for us the hukum, the ruling, that there is division. Uh, that the husband and wife, after this li'an, after this very serious accusation, so when it reaches to this affair, that they are separated, and they are separated uh, permanently uh, due to this, uh, to going through this process of li'an. In the next hadith, <coughs> also a hadith of Imam Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, 
narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the two who were invoking curses regarding one another, Your reckoning is in Allah's hands. For one of you is lying. You cannot remarry her. He, he the man said, O oh, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what about my property, meaning my dowry, my, my mahar? He replied, if you have spoken the truth, it is the price of your having had the right of intercourse with her. And if you have lied against her, it is even more remote for you to get it back from her. Uh, this is the hadith in Bukhari Muslim. In this hadith, the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, anhuma, uh, we see the ruling, we learn the ruling pertaining to what happens after Li'an and some of the other Masail, the other issues or uh, branch issues that result from this issue of Li'an as far as uh, the permanent separation between the husband and wife and also the issue of the Mahar. So in this hadith, there are several uh, benefits. The first uh, benefit of this hadith is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we learn that from this hadith it is evidence which is contrary to the belief of, uh, of some of the extreme sects in Islam, who say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew the, the unseen, but rather we learn from this hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not know the unseen. The only unseen he knew would be from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him knowledge of. And this is illustrated because the Prophet Wasallam said in this hadith, Hisabakuma Allah Ahadukuma kathib. That the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said, uh, and your reckoning uh, is, is it's with the law. Your reckoning is with the law. And one of you is lying. The fact that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam did not know who was lying, this shows that what? The Prophet alayhi salam did not know knowledge of the unseen. He only knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him. And this likewise was the case with all the Anbiya alayhim Abdul Salatu was salam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, also shows us that the relationship between the husband and wife, uh, when they've reached this stage of li'an, that they uh, that they and they finish this process, that they are no longer lawful for one another, and that the uh, that they are separated forever. So we learn this hukum uh, from this hadith. This hadith illustrates for us that ruling that they are separated uh, forever, mu'abbid. And this me and this is a discerned from the statement uh, of the Prophet والسلام, who said, La sabila laka alayha, that there is no way, there's no uh, other means uh, to her, meaning to remain with her. So we learn from this hadith what that the uh, that the people that when it, it comes down to this uh, li'an that the people are no longer that this is a permanent separation uh, that they are no longer lawful for one another ever and it shows what an evil way to separate or a, such a very serious uh, grievous way. Because, because it's due to, to a, the, a grievous sin or the accusation of a grievous sin. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the mahar is not returned. Even if uh, that it's overwhelmingly evidence that uh, she committed uh, adultery okay so uh, or the inclination is that you know that she was she committed adultery so regardless of whatever the case is when it comes to the end there's no returning of the mahar okay there's no returning of the mahar 
And the Prophet Sallallahu even in the hadith, he gave us the illa. He gave us the reason behind that ruling. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, after saying, your reckoning is in Allah's hands, for one of you is lying, you cannot remarry her. That shows us the first hukum. Then the man said, O Allah's Messenger وسلم, what about my property? What about my dowry? What about my mahar? The Prophet وسلم, replied, if you have spoken the truth, it is the price of your having had the right of intercourse with her. And if you have lied against her, it is even more uh, uh, you know, then you are less deserving of gain, getting something back from your, your, your mahar. So it shows us that in both situations, regardless of this, the outcome, regardless of the situation, when it results to li'an, that there is no returning of the mahar. Uh, we also learn from this hadith, is that the mahar, the uh, dowry, uh, is not uh, to be returned even uh, in the situation, uh, or just from khalwa, just from being uh, in the situation of being uh, to, alone together. And this, uh, you know, that so in this ca case, that the from the khalwa, that the woman uh, is deserving of something from the mahar, so it should not be returned uh, to the husband. And this is. Uh, evidence also in the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when talaktumuhunna min, uh, min kabli and tamassuhunna wa kad faradtum lahunna farida fa nisfu ma far, uh, uh, faradtum illa an ya'foon so and the shahid here the main point in this verse is before you have uh, touch them. So that means that half of the mahar should be, uh, would be the, in, the, in that situation of a husband and wife uh, having been alone and then they separated, even if, even if he did not have relations with her. Those are just some of the benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, narrated Anas radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Observe her, and if she gives birth to a child, which is white complexion with dark hair, her husband would be its father. But if she gives birth to a child with eyes looking as if they have kohol in them and curled hair, the man whom her husband charged her with committing adultery is, his, uh, is its father. This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith uh, relates three very important points. Uh, the first point is about the things that are not made clear by revelation, by wahi. Okay, if we find no nothing clear from the Quran or the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the case uh, during his time, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He made, um, if you would say, ijtihad, that he strove to exercise his judgment in regards to those matters. The second point is if the primary sources for decision, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah, <coughs> are not available, making decision by conjecture, uh, this, this makes uh, basically ijtihad permissible. So if there is no proof in the Book of Allah, there's no proof in the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that's clear, defined, uh, a textual uh, proof that deals with the subject or the topic or the issue at hand, then, and there's nothing from the ijma of the scholars 
no, or very little precedence in this matter, or perhaps it requires really looking extensively at that evidence and then deducing a Sharia ruling. And this is the Ijtihad for the people of Ijtihad. So this is the, the striving in order to um, uh, make a, an appropriate hukum for the situation. The third uh, point regarding this hadith, <clears throat> uh, is this hadith also illustrates in the case of Li'an, <clears throat> uh, even if the conjecture is correct, even if this, uh, this uh, the swearing by the husband and the ijtihad that they made, the judge made, is correct that they believe the woman, it's it's pretty overwhelming that she's lying, but she made li'an as well. She also swore to have the curse upon her. There is no punishment for uh, for the woman. There is no punishment for the woman. And her punishment will be in the hereafter if uh, in the case where she was lying. Some other important aspects of this hadith, this hadith also uh, shows us that uh, that it is very important in the Sharia, it is mishru, uh to attempt to uh, verify news or verify uh, a hukum, you know, verify uh, before making a ruling, verify the information which is being said, uh, you know, that there should be an attempt to to try to uh, verify these things, especially when it comes to judgments. It, it has to be verified. And this is in accordance uh, to, with the statement of the Prophet Wasallam, in which he said in that hadith, he said, Absuruha, you know, uh, look at her or, uh, you know, observe her. And then he said, and if she gives birth to a child which is white complexion with dark hair, her husband would be its father. So the Prophet Wasallam asked, you know, for this verification, observe her until she gives birth, and then see, and, and you know, and uh, see how, if the child resembles the father or not, because they're both they've reached this stage in their uh, marital uh, in the, in their marriage in which the tr the trust is lost, and there's accusations of adultery. Uh, as another benefit of this hadith. Is this hadith also shows that, uh, as we said, that you know there's uh, that we that even if there's uh, some doubt with regards to the uh, to the testimony or to the evidence that's being presented or the lack of evidence, that there still needs to be uh, that there's still uh, a judgment. Uh, that will be deduced uh, with regards to the evidence that is present. And those are just some of the benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, in the next hadith, <coughs> narrated Ibn Abbas, <coughs> radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ordered a a man to put his hand on his mouth when he came to the fifth pronouncement and said it would be the deciding one. Uh, this is reported by Abu Dawood and the Nisa'i and its narrators are reliable. In this hadith, uh, its relevance for being in the Li'an because the man was in the process of making Li'an about uh, with regards to his accusation. And uh, Putting the hand on the mouth is a sign to be heedful and cautious and conscious on the last pronouncement. That is such a serious thing, and that's and that such, um, uh, you know, the rulings and the separation of marriage and invoking the curses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on yourself, that these are very serious, serious uh, matters that should not be taken lightly. So, this is was the reason for putting the uh, hand over the over his mouth, uh, because one will have to bear the consequences in this world or in the hereafter with regards to uh, this affair. 
So if the man stops for the fifth time, he will be punished for slandering. It will be considered slandering because he still had made those charges even if he stops from invoking the curse. So that means then it goes from Le'an to Qadf, as we, we talked about briefly in the beginning of this, uh, this chapter. So <clears throat> letting us know how serious this affair is and that it, so there therefore if the man he stops on the fifth time then uh, meaning he doesn't invoke the curses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on him and, and and you know making the fifth uh, proclamation or assertion assertion that she's committed adultery then in this case the uh, since he has stopped he will receive the punishment for uh, slander for slandering his uh, his wife and uh, in this situation also the wo the woman has also the right of Le'an if she wishes from this hadith uh, some of the benefits uh, that are derived from this hadith that the scholars deduce uh, one of the benefits of this hadith is uh, this hadith shows that it is uh, permissible to have someone else, uh, if you will, a wakala or a an agent or someone else to uh, related to this area, even when it had to do with the hadood. And in this hadith, uh, because the Prophet والسلام, he commanded a man, uh, another man to put his hand over the man who was going to swear over his, over uh, about, you know, to make li'an. So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in essence, made, had someone else be not an arbitrator, but instead like an agent to uh, prevent this man from taking a step without being conscious and without pondering the seriousness of the matter. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded someone else to put his mouth over the man's, uh, put his hand over the man's mouth in order to prevent him from uh, making, you know, uh, li'an. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, shows the mishru'iya or the permissibility of when in the case of uh, li'an like this to, um, to, to do this, to put the hand over the mouth, so that way the person has a time to think. Don't don't rush, don't be hasty, hold on a minute. So that shows that it's mishroor, because the Prophet والسلام, is the one who ordered uh, the other man to do so. And another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that the one who supplicates upon themselves and they know that they're lying, meaning they, they, they've made this accusation, especially in Li'an like this, you know, and you hear all the time uh, people take these issues lightly of making vows, making oaths, and swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and even sometimes invoking punishment upon themselves very lightly. So even if they're lying, sometimes people out of arrogance and ignorance, they will invoke these curses upon themselves. So this hadith shows us that the one who does so, that they are deserving of that punishment, that it's, it's such a serious matter that they're deserving. That's why we should not take these issues as light issues. Another benefit of this hadith uh, is this hadith also shows us that uh, that the that it, it, it's uh, permissible to make istifna fi dua to make a uh, make like a condition in the dua to make a condition make a dua conditional and what we mean by that is for example, uh, if a person says, Oh Allah, if this person is Muslim, please forgive him and have mercy upon him. 
meaning that you don't know. You don't know uh, maybe the condition of a particular individual. Uh, maybe a person cut you off on the road and you become upset with them. But instead of replying by cursing them, you say uh, something like this. You actually supplicate to Allah to stop yourself and say, Oh Allah, please, oh Allah, if this person is a Muslim, please forgive him. Or please, uh, uh, you know, and please have mercy upon him. Then this is what is known as istithna uh, fi dua, you know, making the dua uh, conditional. Uh, and so that's another uh, benefit that is derived from this hadith.